need the slides. Thanks a lot, Rajiv. Thank you very much. Next, we have our uh, guest speaker for the day, uh, Deepak Jairaman. <clears throat> He's an executive coach, and um, he focuses pretty much engaging with CXOs, with entrepreneurs, with investors, and other leaders alike. Uh, he has a podcast, <clears throat> podcast by the name Play to Potential, uh, which is available on Apple and Spotify and with 90 plus guests uh, on this podcast he's had more than about 1.4 million listeners which is which is quite sizable given he's just recently started he's ex kpmg ex mckenzie ex egon zender before he started on his own journey of ex being an executive coach sorry alumnus of uh, it madras mamdabad and london business school uh, Deepak, if we can please have you here at the dais, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Can you hear me okay at the back? Visa, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I felt the theme that's worth talking about is playing to potential. You know, I find that if organizations, institutions need to play to potential, then each one of us uh, by corollary, uh, need to be playing to our potential. So that's the theme of my talk. Um, I think before I share some of my perspectives, uh, I want to sh uh, share a little bit of where my insights come from. One is my personal journey. I was with McKinsey in the New Jersey office in the healthcare practice. Uh, that gave me a little bit of a window uh, into what good leadership looks like, but with a little bit of a strategy lens. Then I came back to India and worked in Agon Zender, helping companies recruit CEOs and board members. And that gave me two perspectives. One is how do companies think about leadership in the context of their business strategy, but also how do individuals and candidates think about their aspirations, their journeys, how do they make choices, how do they think about their careers as they navigate their lives. So that was the second perspective. And over the last six years, I've had an opportunity to work with uh, some of the leaders as a coach and a sounding board. And that's given me an insight into, uh, you know, some of the deepest uh, fears, aspirations, emotions that some of these leaders go through as they go through their journey. So that's one, my lived experiences. The other is the podcast which I've been running for the last uh, close to six years now. Uh, and what I've tried to do in the podcast is try and distill insights from different domains, not just get uh, insights from one domain. One is uh, distinguished leaders in the industry, people like Nanda Nilakini, Vinita Bali, Falguni Nair, Harsh Mariwala, Zia Modi, who I was told might be in the audience, but looks like she's not. Uh, second is the world of sport. Some of these are well-known faces, Vijay Amritraj, Vishy Anand. Viren Raskina, who runs the Olympic Gold Quest. He used to be the captain of the Indian hockey team. Um, Deepa Malik, who's a celebrated uh, Paralympian. Paddy Upton, who's currently working with the Indian team as a mental conditioning coach. Creative professionals, designers. The first lady is a lady called Aisha Birsel uh, from Turkey, who's uh, done a lot of thinking around how do you use design principles to design your life. Uh, Atul Kasbaker, uh, who's a producer and a photographer. Karnatic musician Bombay Jayashri, Amish Tripathi, and uh, stand-up comedian Papa CJ, and some of the thinkers and uh, biographers, right? The lady on the left is Amy Edmondson, who was recently voted as the number one thinker in the world by Thinkers 50, which is often considered to be the Oscar Awards for management professionals. Marshall Goldsmith, who's considered one of the great coaches out there, and so on and so forth. But the point being, uh, when I speak today in front of you, uh, I stand on the shoulder of some of these giants in terms of their thinking and their perspectives. So I hope to curate some of those insights as I talk about the theme play to potential. <coughs> Just to lay out the overall structure, uh, first I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the phrase play to potential, what does it mean? Uh, I want to spend time on self-awareness, uh, why it's relevant and why now? And how do we go about self-awareness? It's often, uh, it's it's an often bandied about term, but I want to sort of peel that a uh, couple of layers. Third, I think COVID has taught us uh, the importance of the various domains of life. So I want to spend a little bit of time on what what it takes to lead a full life, playing the long game. I want to talk about balance sheet and PNL not so much 
in the way a private equity investor would think about it, but uh, in, a, in a little more of an intangible sense, and hopefully some of that uh, would resonate. In a world of volatility, I want to focus a little bit on what does it mean to respond versus react? And finally, a couple of themes around the, the, the sort of the, the significance of having a clear why and keeping one's identity small. But the one point I want to leave with you is as, as, as you go through some of these uh, concepts, I think there's an opportunity for us to reflect at two levels. One is at an individual level, what does it mean to me uh, as an individual and what lessons can I take away? And second is I think there is a parallel lesson to be drawn at an institutional level. You know, what does it mean in terms of the business, the institution that we run and the business we're trying to build? So my initial thoughts, actually my, before I started this podcast a few years back, if you'd asked me what does the term potential mean, I would have gone to my physics book, right? I would have said, at point A, there's some potential energy that gets converted to kinetic energy by the time it comes to point B. That was my understanding of uh, what the term potential meant. The other perspective I had was the, the point around the deck of cards, right? I think the quote that comes to mind is a quote from Warren Buffett. He said that, uh, you know, a lot of us, uh, we are blessed with an ovarian lottery in terms of just where we are born. And if you had an opportunity to dip your bowl, which had seven, seven billion balls representing the population, would you dip your hand and exchange your current context with another ball or would you be happy where you are? I'd like to believe that most of us are in a place where the very fact that we are sitting here means that we would probably not dip our hands in that jar and we're quite happy where we are. The point he makes is uh, we're all blessed with a certain deck of cards which is skills, genetics, capabilities, networks, ecosystems, relationships. And, and the, the notion of potential being, given the deck of cards, what's the best game of cards we can play? But I think over the last few years, uh, my thinking has evolved slightly. Uh, and I want to start uh, with uh, showing an image and asking you to guess who this person is. Any guesses uh, who this person is? Maybe one more image and that might make it a little easier. So this is Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon, right? And one of my early guests was Vijay Amritraj, or the very first guest actually. Um, and he spoke about the fact that he'd interviewed Buzz Aldrin at some point in his home in Westwood in California. And he shared a perspective on the notion of potential which I wanted to share with you. Let me just play a short audio clip. Uh, in one of my interviews, one of my guests on one of my talk shows, was the second man on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, who was a friend of mine. And when I went to interview him at his home in Westwood in California, you know, you look at all the various accolades and so on and so forth, like we've seen in people's homes and trophies and plaques and so on and so forth. So very few things really catch your eye as you go through pictures and you go through this and that. But there was this one little plaque in the corner that absolutely caught my eye. and. Um, and I've never forgotten it, and it always is very much in the back of my mind when I do things. And uh, it was in, stuck in a corner in his, in his living room, and it said, uh, you know, we always tell, each, tell kids as you grow up, you know, you better do this, you know, where if you fulfill your potential, sky's the limit, sky's the limit, you know, everything's always sky's the limit, you know. And so that little plaque said, who said sky's the limit when I left my footprints on the moon? And I find this quote uh, inspiring, right? I think the, the, the one thing I took away from this was somewhere there's a certain finiteness that we assume around potential, but technically the human potential could be considered infinite, right? And I find this quote quite powerful saying, who said sky's the limit when I could set the footprints on the moon? The other question I ask a lot of the guests is, what does the term play to potential mean to you? And one of the guests actually put the ball back in my court saying the answer is in the title. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you can never work to your potential. You can only play to your potential. And I said, okay, uh, that, that made sense. I hadn't quite thought of it when I framed it that way. But I think the, the piece I want to leave you with is, I feel early in our journeys, we are quite moldable. It's like Play-Doh. Play uh, we adapt to different environments. We learn, we adapt, we build new muscles, etc. But I think as we go through our journey, uh, over time, I think the plasticity increases and we become more like Lego blocks. So I think the point around being intentful about choice 
in terms of the whatever whatever we choose to do in terms of the business we choose to build or the profession we uh, choose to pursue i think if we can tune into what feels like play for us i think there are greater odds of us playing to our potential and the second is the point uh, vijay makes about the fact that human potential is infinite it's not necessarily finite to dive into uh, you know some of the themes i want to start with the screen right uh, some of the people here might relate to the screen when i was a child growing up uh, we we used to live in a town called gwalior in madhya pradesh and uh, before the tv started we had to sit in front of the tv for half an hour waiting for the programming to start it started with a program about farmers krishi darshan if i remember right and uh, you know in 1993 when i graduated from school dd metro came in and that was like a 100% increase in the number of channels that was beamed to a house and if i cut to today you know if i just look at the content you know you have the various dth platforms that are streaming content we have hundreds of channels we have netflix amazon prime hotstar and all these ott platforms and if that's not enough we have content sort of coming through you know all these various things on the mobile but the point is i feel this world of content is symptomatic of what we are seeing in various domains of life you know from a choice perspective you know whether it's banks whether it's food whether it's apparel whether it's travel i think we are living in a world of abundance and i think i've been inspired by the work of a behavioral economist barry schwartz at the university of california at berkeley and he's written a book paradox of choice and he says when whenever individuals have too much choice intuitively you would think that when you give people a lot of choice consumers would be happier but he says very often no and he says it sort of boils to two things distills it to two things one is decision making becomes complex second is the fomo factor just multiplies right because if you just have one channel to watch you'll sleep well at night knowing that that was the only option but when you had 100 channels to choose from you're always going to wonder did i miss a good movie or did i miss a cricket match and you're always going to be sort of looking around the bend to see what did i miss and in this context uh, one of the guests i spoke to rama bijapurkar who's a you know a consumer insights specialist and a board member she shared an insight which i thought uh, was very valuable in the context of uh, dealing in this world of abundance and i wanted to play a small clip here but i think the more there are choices uh, the more you have to be centered the world is complex and volatile and i think the more complex and volatile it is the more you have to understand your center and your core you know mm. going back to the earlier discussion we were having you have to really really understand so if you are anchored then you can withstand being buffeted it's the same for companies too right i tell companies that if you're going to do competitor busting and whatever the competitor came up with you're going to re-engineer it reverse engineer it and do better when you have 20 competitors who are putting out 20 products because they also don't know all ready fire aim then are you going to bust 400 how do you know which for 20 of the 400 to bust it's noise yeah yeah so you eventually have to have a deep understanding of who you are and what you're trying to do with your customers and take it from there so if you don't have that who you are understanding or at least your navigational principles very true I think yeah the bar on in understanding of the inner world has gone gone up yeah to absolutely. cope right then then it, the, the need for it probably wasn't as pronounced yeah. 20 years back but the noise back. that stops you from doing it is also a lot higher i think the key takeaway for me here is do you understand the consumer in which case it's you right do we understand ourselves do we as a company know you know i saw avamesh talk about the the core thesis around which you will invest every organization every individual needs to have extraordinary clarity around what is your core competency and if we don't and if we are all over the place at some stage in a world of abundance uh, you people are going to struggle the second piece that i i found insightful in this conversation was she says while the bar on sort of tuning in is higher the noise that comes in the way is also higher so it's it's a strange paradox it's it's that it's gotten that much harder for us to be with ourselves and the last point i will make is very often individuals think that the official feedback process often takes care of this but i find that unless we individually take care of sort of tuning into the inner world the the organization is not going to help us get there it's an individual responsibility that we all need to take so the, that begs the question how do you really build self awareness right and i want to sort of tune into an insight from a lady called tasha yurik 
who's studied self-awareness for several years and uh, she shares an insight which I think uh, I found uh, quite thought-provoking. Um, self-awareness is made up of two types of self-knowledge. The first is something we named internal self-awareness, which is essentially knowing who we are on the inside. Uh, what do we value? What are we passionate about? What are our aspirations? What are the, the patterns of behavior that we exhibit across situations? But equally important is something called external self-awareness. And in a nutshell, what that means is knowing how other people see us. And what was fascinating, at least to me in our research, was that we found that those two types of self-knowledge, both are required for us to really be self-aware, but they're not related to each other, which I, I was kind of surprised by. I, I always thought, you know, if somebody kind of knows who they are from the inside, of course they would do the work and find out how they were seen on the outside and vice versa. But we discovered that they are, um, you, you sort of have to think about them as independent skill sets within the self-awareness area. Let me illustrate with an example, right? When I was ch choosing to figure out, when I was trying to figure out what next after McKinsey, the typical options I considered were sort of quant heavy, analytics heavy opportunities, sort of strategic planning roles in companies, VCP and those kinds of roles. But one of my mentors at McKinsey looked at me and said, you have some sort of a people orientation. Have you thought of search? Now that external self-awareness, which came from him, I could have never, I could have sit and meditated under a tree for a week and I wouldn't have gotten that insight. So that I could have only gotten when I asked the people around me. So I think sometimes this whole point of external and internal self-awareness often being orthogonal, I find to be a pro uh, profound point. And I think the, the related point here is if I go back to my father's career, for example, he was in a public sector bank for 40 years, right? And very often, maybe a few, a few decades back, you know, a, a career or a, or a business looked like a, a motor highway. And if you wanted to succeed in that highway, and if you were an automobile, you needed to have a good engine, strong engine, you would, you would sort of do well in the race. But I think today the world, in a, in a world of abundance, looks a lot more like a maze with a lot of twists and turns. And what you need is a compass or a good steering wheel. So in terms of the critical component that you need to get right, it's, it's sort of the sort of the key value lever is slowly moving. I mean, the engine is important, but if you have an engine without a steering wheel, you're going to crash and burn somewhere. You're going to hit some wall very soon. And I think that, that compass or steering wheel, I believe, is self-awareness. And I think the paradox is, as you do well in life, as an institution, as an individual, it's just that the, given the asymmetry of power, you start receiving, you, you, start, uh, you stop receiving good signal. There's a lot of noise and there's a lot of silence. People don't really tell you what they think of you. It's just because of where you sit in the food chain. So it becomes that much harder for you to really access, you know, uh, what people think of you and uh, whether it's a company or whether it's you as an individual. And the last point I would make here is that you know, as you think about self-awareness, don't just, very often the discussion veers towards this is what I'm good at, this is what I could be better at. But I think going back to the, the point around playing to potential, I, I find it helpful if people can tune into what is play for them. You know, what makes you come alive? What gives you energy? If I go back to my journey again, when I was at Econ Zender at Executive Search, you know, one of my review conversations, I remember my boss, it was a gentleman called Govind Ayer, who was a friend and a mentor. He asked me, so tell me what were the high points in the year last year as a search consultant? And a good search consultant having fun would have said, when I closed this search or when I won this mandate, and I remember telling him, my best moments were when I sat down with a couple of leaders and counseled them on their journeys, and they sent a thank you note. He said, that's fantastic, but that's not good for business. You know, that's when I realized that, you know, what gave me energy was slightly different from the business model of the company I was operating in. But tuning into what felt like play for me made me sort of in a way gave me the conviction to make the transition from poaching to coaching. And uh, it's been a very different journey since then. So I think, I think there's a uh, huge uh, power in tuning into what gives you energy, not just what you're good at. The other piece I would talk about is this whole uh, point around looking at ourselves as a whole, right? And here I'm uh, influenced by the work of a gentleman called Stu Friedman. He's at the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton Business School. 
and he's studied work-life integration for the last three, four decades. And uh, he talks about four domains, self, work, home, and community. And he says, we need to think about these things holistically. And I wanted to play a clip and then uh, share an insight. It's not a perfect uh, taxonomy or categorization, but it seems to work pretty well and it seems to work universally mm -hmm. um, because I brought this now to you know, all over the world. Uh, so so the, the community piece, just to answer your question about like, what is that and how is it relevant, uh, some you know people struggle with that. And I often get questions about, well, what is community and why does that matter? Um, community captures kind of everything outside of you and your work and your family. So that includes your network of friends um, and neighbors, uh, people in you know the place where you live. Uh, but it could also include people that you are engaged with in some kind of political group or or religious group. Mm -hmm. um, so that usually has some meaning for most people. Uh, it may not be the most important thing. Mm -hmm. For some people it is. And the self, of course, is who are you as an individual, you know, in your own private sphere, the things that matter to your, your physical health, your mental health and, and emotional uh, mm -hmm. growth. And your spiritual life, which is important to some people and not to others. Mm -hmm. but, but these aspects of, it, of our existence are, you know, for most people, pretty important. Uh, so these four buckets, if you will, uh, seem to capture most of our experience. And it's also simple. What, what I found interesting was very often I find that the discussion around work and home framed as a two-piece jigsaw, right? You have home and you have work. But I think the fact that it's a four-piece jigsaw I find as a helpful frame. And what I mean by that is if we ignore the self part, I find that it leads to, you know, burnout, lack of energy and vitality. I think Amir spoke about a burnout problem with radiologists. I think it's a, it's a universal problem. I think uh, radiologists, maybe it's a little more pronounced, but I think it's a universal problem, especially during COVID. And the second is I find that if you ignore the community piece, either as an organization or as an individual, at some stage it leads to some sort of a hollowness or a lack of purpose, which eventually catches up with you. You might sort of get away with it in the short term, but if you're looking for building businesses to last or solving for the long term, uh, there's no way you can ignore the wider community piece where you can make a difference. And the other piece he mentions which I find helpful is treat these as porous compartments where there's osmosis across the four containers. You know, it's not a zero-sum game where you have 10 hours and you do two hours of this and two hours of that. But he says, is there a way you can architect three-way wins or four-way wins? Again, a very personal example, right? I learned the guitar on the weekends. Earlier I used to shut myself in a room and practice. But then I said, why don't I make it fun and use that as an opportunity to connect with the kids? So then I started playing songs that they like and they learn. So is there a way we can integrate one domain with another if you want to do community work rather than doing social service on your own? Is there a way you can make it an organizational initiative? In McKinsey, we used to have team building sessions while painting a fence in a not-for-profit. Is there a way you can sort of combine an organizational objective with the community objective and not see them as watertight compartments, but allow some sort of osmosis across these domains. Coming to playing the long game, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to speak to Nandan Elikeni, both uh, on his transitions. Transitions, again, is an area of curiosity, and I, I heard you talk about transitions in the context of the pipeline. But, uh, you know, Infosys to UID to what he does now, and um, one of the things he said uh, was around how he thinks about selecting co-founders, which I thought uh, was very interesting. Again, the term duration, I'm sure, whether you're an asset uh, allocation company or as an individual, I think it's important to get the duration right, both on the liabilities and the asset side. But uh, I'll just share this insight and then uh, share my observations. No, I think uh, the choice of co-founders is one of the seminal choices hmm. of any startup for multiple reasons. First is that you must share common vision. Mm. 
you must share a common value system you must share a common desire to postpone your gratification for another day because building companies especially building companies to last is not a sprint it's a marathon right so if your partners are short term oriented your partners want quick rewards if your partners have ethical issues it does work the time frames need to uh, yeah everybody should say okay we will need to defer rewards for a decade and that's a big big ask so i think the big lesson in infosys was that and murthy had done a great job in assembling the people uh, the fact that all of us were united in a common vision to create a global company all of us were united that you are going to do a very ethically run company with clear standards of ethics and corporate governance and that we are willing to defer gratification for decades if required mm. that was the binding glue and the fact that we put the vision above any of us so i think getting the right <coughs> founders is very important from a vision values time frame of gratification point of view he speaks about in the context of co-founder selection but i find that this is a profound point which impacts how you think about investors how you think about employees how you think about advice you know if i look at my relationships with some of the organizations in some cases it's a transaction in some cases it's a journey where they say you are sort of helping us unlock human capital and we want to see you as a partner for the long term and just the extent to which i'm vested and how much i'm able to give myself it's very apparent when it's a transaction when it's a journey so even as you're thinking about your journeys as individuals or as institutions the more you can have collaborators playing a similar timeline and duration whether it's investors or advisors or employees the greater the odds of long term sustainable value creation the other thinker who's inspired me in this space is a lady called linda gratton uh, she's a professor at london business school and she's written a book called 100 year life and uh, she talks about this notion of uh, intangible assets which uh, which i found uh, thought provoking very often our default wiring is to measure what's very visible you know clay christensen in his book how will you measure your life says that very often we tend to measure what's in front of us and what's visible and what's tangible but she talks a little bit about how do you think about measuring intangibles which i think is relevant Well, you know, as you know, in the book we talked about three types of intangible assets. We talked about productive assets, vitality assets, and transformational assets. And I think, really, um, you know, in your forties, uh, the productive assets become really important because you need to keep on learning. You need to keep on building new skills. Um, you need to be uh, saying to yourself and to the labour market, you know, I'm still somebody who's got a lot to offer from now until the age of seventy. So that's really crucial. But also, of course, transformational assets, and those are, uh, as we said earlier, you know, transformation transformational assets are a lot to do with your network. So if mm-hmm. at forty you find yourself spending all your time with people just like you. then that's not going to help you to transform so you should be looking around and asking yourself am i spending time with people who are different from me in terms of their nationality or their mindset or their age or their gender she talks about three types of assets right productive assets vitality assets and transformation assets productive assets are things like skills and capabilities that help us deliver the pnl of today vitality assets are a bit like the health you know our health our energy our uh, you know our uh, spiritual mental uh, going back to the four p's jigsaw some of those things which help us uh, stay relevant and transformational assets are around are you investing to stay relevant in the future you know one and two take care of today three takes care of tomorrow you know what are the kinds of networks you're building you know who are the kind of people you're hanging out with are they going to be relevant in the context of you reinventing yourself as you move forward or staying relevant as you move forward i think the just to maybe bring it to life i feel when we think about measurements very often we measure flow items right Re- revenues uh, number of deals closed etc etc they are often pnl items but i think there are a lot of these intangibles which are worth zooming into team engagement organization culture you know to what extent are you catching up without agenda the quality of client relationships you're building you know in agon zender one of the things we would do was while evaluating the performance of a consultant we'd say how many new high stakeholder relationships are you building of course 
the number of leads you generate matters. But what's even more important for us is, are you operating at the highest level and building the right kind of relationships? What is the trust in the ecosystem for the work you're doing? Similarly, if I sort of distill it to the individual level, you know, very often we measure progress by the to-do list, the number of hours we clocked, sort of flow input metrics. But what about things like health, you know, hours of sleep, extent of me time, your investment in capability building? You know, those are the kinds of things that begin to matter when we start tuning into intangible assets. I want to move to Vishy Anand, right? Uh, you know, uh, the best metaphor I got for responding versus reacting is somebody said, imagine you're a batsman. Uh, I'm assuming most of the people here follow the cricketing uh, metaphor. And you had someone like a Ravi Chandran Ashwin bowling to you. You know, one ball might be over-pitched, one ball might be a full toss, one ball might be a dusra, one ball might be a flipper. So you can't premeditate a shot. You need to sort of play each ball. You need to be aware of each ball and have a different approach to each ball. And, and, and a very similar uh, principle applies even to the way we lead our life, right? Every moment is almost like a new ball being bowled at us. So are we agile to the moment and are we responding to the moment or are we reacting? The reacting equivalent being having a premeditated shot. You know, I'm going to deal with this situation like this and walking in with a very clear premeditated shot. And chess legend Vishy Anand uh, made a very uh, nuanced point in the context of chess where he said that very often around move 40 in a timed uh, match, the clock gets reset, uh, a few minutes gets added. And when the few minutes get added, then the whole game strategy changes. You know, when you have, how you play when you have 10 seconds on the clock is very different from how you have when you have five minutes on the clock. But he says, very often players don't adjust to that and end up making very silly mistakes. Your brain is a wild horse there. <laughs> and you need to work with it. Hmm. Um, you need to work with it. Sometimes it'll betray you and uh, it's operating according to its own clock, its own schedule. Um, you can't impose control on that. And so creativity partly is learning how to um, um, understand that you will lose control. So I've often alluded to this thing of losing control. Mm. Losing control can happen at many levels, psychological, um, you can feel uncomfortable with playing something and so on. And so um, in chess, it's not enough to focus on uh, um, the skills you can learn. Mm -hmm. There are also the skills uh, you must become intelligent. Um, I'll give you one quick example. Mm -hmm. um, I would often get to move 40. And move 40 is significant because it's the end of the first time control, which means that you get a fresh uh, uh, amount of time on your clock and you, normally your time pressure is over. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, the moment, the time between move 32 and 40 is so tense mm -hmm. and they're so caught up in it, they're not able to stop. Mm. They'll make the 40 move anyway. And especially once upon a time, I was very prone to this error. Mm. Um, and I was also prone to an error that when I had half an hour and my opponent had three seconds, I would try to play faster that he wouldn't have any time to think. It doesn't take a lot of intelligence to stop yourself and see that if you play fast, to not give him any time to think, you're not giving yourself any time to think either. Mm. So these were two areas where I had problems. And one of the things uh, I did was I would simply make a mental note. I would think of some painful loss I had suffered as a result of these habits. So that when I went to the board, when I was in move 35, my opponent down to three seconds, he's shaking and the temptation is overwhelming. And I have half an hour, I'm in no pressure. I would just uh, tell myself to get up, go to the refreshment area, have a little bit of water, or some coffee, and then I'd come back. And I found that this broke the tension. Hmm. It, I stopped, uh, I had become too emotionally uh, uh, bound in the game and this broke that. And then I was able to uh, bring some sanity to the process. And especially doing this after move 40 when neither of us is in any tension anymore. Right. But just getting up, going away and leaving it for 10 minutes. And then you come back and you find that it re resets your brain almost. So that's one technique. But there are techniques like this that you learn, uh, you know, you're part of your bag of tools and your toolkit and uh, that's how it works. I think the other sporting analogy which I found helpful was if you take tennis, it's a bit like where do you stand when you receive a serve? You know, the serve could be wide or it could be down the tee. So how do you stay center of the court? And similarly, how do you stay centered in terms of your emotions? 
so that you're able to face the next ball or the next moment that comes towards you. And the other, uh, the classic, uh, you know, uh, movie that I thought uh, brought this to life was the movie Sully. Uh, you know, uh, Tom Hanks plays the central character. It's about a plane that took off, uh, I think it was in the winter of 2009, gets hit by a flock of birds upon takeoff and has to land on the Hudson. And if you just see the pilot, how cool he is, how calm he is, how composed he is, how present he is, when he deals with the three minutes between the bird hit and when he lands the plane on the Hudson, I think it's it's about that. It's not about panicking. It's not about reacting. It's just about being centered and being response flexible to every moment that comes in front of you. I think you can't be in Taj addressing a group of Tata Capital people and not talk about the Tata Group. I had an opportunity to talk to Harish Bhatt, uh, the brand custodian of the Tata Group, and and. And he made a point. He said, if you, if you want to play the long game, if you want to build to last, and going back to Stu Friedman's fame, framework, four-piece jigsaw as well, you can't not care about the communities you operate in. Right? You need to care about multiple stakeholders and carry everybody along for you to play the long game and to really build an institution that lasts. Story you just mentioned of Gandhiji in Jamshedpur. Mm -hmm. uh, I, really, I really enjoyed researching and then narrating the story. Uh, I enjoyed reading all this, reading the long speech that he delivered in Jamshedpur and why he went to Jamshedpur and what he saw there and what he said. Uh, you know, you're quite right. Uh, one of the quotes is what you mentioned just now, that even though I've been obliged to range myself seemingly against capital, capitalists have in the end regarded me as their true friends. And he says, my identification with labor does not conflict with my friendship with capital. But there is another powerful quote in the same story, Deepak, which uh, has sat deeply in my mind. And this is the, uh, you know, towards the end of the speech that Gandhi, uh, Gandhiji delivered in Jamshedpur in 1925. He says, may God grant that in serving the Tatas, you will also serve India and will always realize that you're here for a much higher mission than merely working for an industrial enterprise. What a powerful statement that is. You know, it must have moved every member of the Tata Steel family who was present in Jamshedpur, listening to Gandhiji that day. Hmm. And it moves me and many of my colleagues in the Tata group even today. So that's a beautiful story, Gandhiji in Jamshedpur. I like the phrase he says, identification with labor does not conflict with my friendship with capital. So I think the idea is how do we really be inclusive when we think about growth, either as investors, as entrepreneurs, as advisors? And I think one of the questions that comes out of this is what is the why, right? What is our why? And here I want to uh, bring your attention to an insight from Viren Raskina, who used to be the Indian hockey captain who now helps Olympians uh, train and win uh, medals at the, uh, at the highest stage. And he talks about, you know, one of the questions I asked him was what's the difference between those elite athletes who end up winning at the highest level versus those that train but fall short? And he spoke about the criticality of the why. The why is very important for every person. And what does it mean to that person? And I've seen many super talented athletes, but just the why is not very clear to them. They're, uh, they're sort of drifting hmm. and it's not very clear to them what is their dream? Why are they doing what they are doing hmm. every single day in training? For me, the, the why has always been very clear. Hmm. And uh, that I wanted to win an Olympic medal as a player. And I was shattered when I couldn't win it myself. Hmm. And now what drives me every single day to ensure that the same mistakes are not repeated for the next generation of players. I find that powerful. Uh, you know, one of the other terms that came up was uh, growth mindset. I think, Visa, you spoke about growth mindset in the context of your team. You know, uh, when I think about my why, I see my why as helping people play to their unique potential, whether it's through the content I create or the advisory work I do. So that having that clarity has enabled me to say no to a few things and yes to a few things. And it's been a very helpful prioritization mechanism. But it's also been a helpful shock absorber when I hit a bump, right? When you hit, uh, what I find is why also is a great contributor towards resilience. You know, all of us, all businesses, all institutions go through good times and bad times. 
and having a very clear why gives you an opportunity to huddle as an organization or as a unit to to really say this is why we do what we do and rally forward <clears throat> and i think what i've realized is very often as as we become senior uh, people want an authentic story around why you do what you do you know just saying that i'm a i'm an xyz professional doesn't cut it anymore for 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 people to really build trust with you as an individual or as an institution unless there is a very clear why you know as as sort of the paradigm of leadership shifts from command and control to inspire and enroll people don't get inspired if you don't have an authentic inspiring why that drives you and your company and finally given its sort of 75th years of year of independence and harish bhat spoke about gandhi ji i felt it was appropriate to close uh, with a quote about gandhi ji from ram guha who was uh, who's his biographer he talks about this notion of identity and he talks about the fact that gandhi ji didn't see himself as one single narrow monolithic person but he saw himself as a combination of many uh, facets and i think i find that profoundly inspiring in the way we think of ourselves in the way we think of uh, reinvention uh, and possibilities as individuals and organizations so i think it's best to uh, read out uh, just three paragraphs of my book okay to explain how Gandhi himself saw his multiple callings. Uh -huh. So here I'm reading out Gandhi. Uh -huh. It is uh, my what I say about Gandhi, and then uh, there's a quote of Gandhi in between. Sure. To deliver India from British rule was by no means Gandhi's only preoccupation. The forging of harmonious relations between India's often disputatious religious communities was the second. The desire to end the pernicious practice of untouchability in his own Hindu faith was the third. and the impulse to develop economic self reliance for india and moral self reliance for indians was a fourth these campaigns were conducted by gandhi in parallel all were to him of equal importance in 1933 he wrote to a close friend that quote my life is one indivisible whole my life is one indivisible whole i cannot devote myself entirely to untouchability and say neglect hindu muslim unity or swaraj all these things run into one another and are interdependent you will find that one time in my life an emphasis on one thing at another time on another but that is just like a pianist now emphasizing one note and now another but they are all related to one another end of quote and this is what i say in the end for gandhi political independence meant nothing at all unless it was accompanied by religious harmony caste and gender equality and the development of self respect in every indian other patriots had used the hindi word swaraj to signify national independence gandhi made indians aware of its true or original meaning swaraj or self rule fascinating yeah. fascinating that is gandhi in his own words and that's also why as i told you a little while ago i don't believe in saying this is the most important thing this is the only cause this is the one route to success you know gandhi conducted these multiple careers and saw them of equal importance and at different times different aspects of his work came into the forefront others receded then those came into the forefront and so on i think if i take a couple of examples right if if i take the world of investing so michael moritz of sequoia capital started his life as a journalist right uh, who uh, if he'd seen himself as a journalist you know uh, it's just it's, it's a useful thought experiment to have had gandhi ji thought himself as a as a lawyer then how would life have been you know if wipro thought itself as a vegetable oil company which it was when it started it wouldn't be the 27 billion dollar company that it's today so i think it's worth just not getting constrained by some of the identities we create around ourselves whether as organizations or as individuals <clears throat> I think in summary uh, I think it's worth tuning into what's play self awareness is critical all the more in the world of abundance let's ensure we solve the four piece jigsaw not get constrained not get distracted by just two variables in the in the jigsaw focus on the intangibles as much as the tangibles build the uh, muscle to respond to each ball uh, on its merit as they say 
be clear about your why and leave the identity small so that we leave room for possibilities. With that, uh, thank you. Do we have time for Q&A? Yes, we do. We do. We do. <laughs> we, have a, we have a mic we can take around in case you have questions to put to Deepak. I know I'm coming between, uh, between me and dinner. Let me repeat this time. How do you, because one of the challenges for all our entrepreneurs, they are mid-sized entrepreneurs, they are running anywhere between 50, 100 crore, 200 crore businesses. It's, the framework that you've given is nice, but it's not easy to follow when you're fighting so many battles vis-a-vis -vis your core business that is concerned. Obviously, a lot of what you said is a, can't serve as a facilitator for them to strengthen their inner core and you know look to build. But it's one thing for them to see this presentation. How does one act on it? Especially for a lot of these guys who are running quarter to quarter, running month on month, and on top of it, we going out there and looking over the shoulders and saying, okay, give me their mayas, give me the projections. So, how, Because that is the messaging that will help. Sure. Now, I must confess, playing to potential, we could spend three days and still only scratch the surface, right? I just, uh, what I shared was just literally not even the tip of the iceberg. So, so clearly by no means was this meant to be a laundry list or a, a list that a checklist. But I think uh, if I may use a healthcare metaphor, given that's the theme, um, I would say there's, an, there's a merit in doing the equivalent of a comprehensive health checkup. You know, it's like, it's like healthcare, right? If, if I have to lead a healthy life, I'll do a health checkup. And then that's a starting point, and then I figure out, do I need an intervention? Do I need to focus on my diet, cardiologist, etc.? I would say the leaders I work with, I say, why don't you start with some sort of a leadership uh, assessment of sorts? You know, uh, again, people sort of take a, go to the back foot when you say assessment. But why don't you have, get some feedback on your strengths, your what makes you distinctive? Very often I notice that people don't realize what makes them distinctive and what some of the development areas are. And that can often lead to a couple of things, right? One is it informs your trajectory in terms of the muscles you need to build. It also informs the kind of gaps in your organization. You know, maybe if strategic uh, insight is not uh, uh, is not your strength at your level and you know co-founding team maybe that leads to the question about okay then how do we bring that in either through an advisor or by hiring that kind of a resource so I would say if there is one thing I want to sort of maybe highlight among the 10 things I said I would say self-awareness if, if there's an opportunity for you to do an equivalent of a health checkup on the leadership front it's often a good place to start because a it gives you the conviction to double down on what makes you distinctive B, it gives you the ability to sort of uh, solve for uh, potential gaps in the portfolio, in the talent portfolio. And are there pathology labs that do that? There are organizations and institutions that do that. Uh, and very often, that's the starting point when I engage with somebody. Uh, I start with the check. And, and that's a combination of both. In, I, I go back to internal and external self-awareness, right? One is about a lot of us very often don't realize that we are accumulation of our experiences. You know, and sometimes the institutions we go to or, the, or the, the, the LinkedIn view doesn't quite capture what makes us distinctive. And there's an opportunity to understand that both by reflecting on our journey and by gathering data, not just from the professional front, but the personal front. You know, if somebody needs to get to know me, a 15 minute chat with my wife will be a lot more insightful about, you know, what makes me distinctive and what my issues are. So sometimes I find that people in the work context don't tune in enough on the data from the personal context. And I find that uh, that's a lost opportunity. Uh, Deepak, uh, just uh, this is a lovely model you've drawn up for us. But you know, there's something going in my mind. And I'm trying to find where it would fit in. That's intuition. Where does intuition fit into this? Because you know, it, it's something which 
I mean, I've, I've taken certain decisions in life and I found, you know, intuitively, I've done the right thing. But how does it fit into this framework? Um, I would say, first of all, my, I, I'm not proposing a framework here, sir, at all. Uh, intuition definitely, I think, has a role to play. In a way, that's the muscle memory of judgment that you've built over the years of experience. And uh, like they say, I mean, I, love, I read a lovely book called The Inner Game of Tennis. And it says that, you know, when, when tennis players start using the head, they often making, start making mistakes. Because the, there's sort of that bodily intelligence, muscle memory that's been built over years and years of just shots in the nets. So in a way, I see intuition as just that. Because you've, you've got a certain lived experience and a certain set of judgment and a certain set of things because you've seen patterns and you've seen situations that leads you to form a hunch on situations. So absolutely, I think we need to tap into that to the extent possible. But I think the only caveat there is we need to ensure that, um, you know, back to the point about risk, we, we sort of ensure there are checks and balances to ensure that our intuition doesn't betray the data in front of us. Any more questions that we can request Deepak to take? Thank you, Deepak. I think there are more, no more questions, but thanks for taking time out and giving us these gospels, to be honest, that were around us, but we never really thought of them in this fashion. And those were very precisely delivered. Thanks a lot Thank for this. So we've come towards the end of uh, this pleasant evening that we had organized for, for everyone around here. Uh, the dinner is uh, going to be served in a few minutes uh, towards the back of the room, please. Uh, and obviously, not to mention the important uh, uh, location there wherein you can get yourself clicked and framed uh, as you and you can collect that frame as you move out. Thank you very much and I uh, really enjoyed uh, being here and thanks a lot for all your presence. Thank you. <laughs>